Amen. Good morning, Real Life Church. Everybody good? Yeah. Been a good week? How, how many of you enjoying this fall weather? Nice, right? How many of you enjoy the ability to add layers? Yes. I'm a layers guy. Hide some stuff, right? So good to see you guys. I'm glad you're here. Praying that it's, a, it's been a great week for you. Praying that God has a good week coming for you. Uh, I'm going to have you turn in your Bible, if you would, to James chapter 1. Uh, James chapter 1, we're going to read a couple verses there, and then I'm going to throw some other scripture at you throughout the sermon, but that's your key text this morning is James chapter 1. If you're with us and you're in life groups, I'm going to do my best to make sure you get your blanks filled out, um, but pay close attention because I'm probably just going to roll right through them. I'm not going to warn you. All right? Second thing, today I'm preaching on submission. Ladies, it's not to you. It's to all of us, all right? Usually when a pastor says that, they're like, oh, yeah, submit yourself to your husbands, like, you know, and uh, no, we're, we're going to talk about just godly submission. Um, you go, Pastor Vince, I'm too proud to submit. Well, then you're probably going to miss heaven. I know that's a big statement, but the only way in which you receive Christ is through submitting to Christ. It's the only way. And so if you're too prideful to submit, Godspeed. Okay? Today, some of you Christians are going to have to submit some things, and let me just tell you, I've been praying for you this week. I've been praying for you. Because it's not this, this discipline that we're getting into now, we're several weeks in, we are on the outward disciplines. In other words, these are disciplines that as we add them to our life, they will begin to be noticeable to the world around us. And I'm just going to say it, for the last several years, Christians have not done a great job of being Christ-like to the world around us. So, knowing what season we're in, or we're about to enter into, how many of you know what happens in 2024? An election. How many of you know that in the last election, most people on our planet, or at least in our country who gave a rip, lost their ever-loving minds. Okay? Now, let me be clear so that there's no confusion. I mean, on both sides, we lost our ever-loving mind, as if there were only two sides. Okay? Today, I'm speaking to you as a representative of the cross, and so to clarify my point, I speak from one side, his. And so, as we get into today, some of you are going to be mad. Just get it out right now. Just say, I'm mad. I'm mad. Those are the ones that already see it coming. <laughs> some people were like, I don't think I'm going to be mad. And some people were like, I better say it because it's probably going to happen. Um, and so we're going to talk about anger and we're going to talk about offense. How many of you have ever been offended? How many of you have ever been angry? How many of you are good at being angry? Okay. All right. <laughs> It was awesome. In the 830 service, it was primarily just this section right here. <laughs> like they were like, it's us, Pastor Vance. It's us. Like no one else in the room raised their hand. And this group of about 30 people were like, we're mad about it all. And I'm like, this sermon is for you today. So it's spread out, not just you guys today. So I'm going to see if I can work the other side of the room. Um, offense is kind of crazy to me. I, I, I grew up and I'm still growing up in regard to my offense. Uh, let me give you the scripture first, James chapter 1, verse 19. Very familiar passage of scripture. Most people are aware of this. My dear brothers and sisters, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this is you. If you have said yes to following Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is you. James is writing this verse to you. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to become angry. We're going to close in prayer. I'm going to just let you all ponder that today. <laughs> 
we're not great at this. We're, we are not great at this. And I'm just going to talk about humanity for a second. And especially we Americans, we're not great at this. Okay. We're just not. This isn't me America bashing because no, I love where I live and I'm thankful for where I live. So don't misunderstand. I'm just saying that with where we live and the freedoms that we've had, there is a level of pride that we have embraced. And so for some reason, we feel like we have the right to say what we think. When in reality, a lot of times, the majority of times, and I hope you hear this, it doesn't matter what you think in a lot of the situations. But because we can, we do. There are other things you can do that you should not do. You can eat your couch. You can. You shouldn't. It's not a good idea. But it's not a sin. You won't answer for that one before God. It's weird, but it, you won't answer for it before God. And so as I've been studying this, God has really been kind of wrecking me because when I used to think about getting angry or getting offended, as I was younger, I always thought about like, man, somebody made me so mad I want to fight. Any of y'all been so mad you want to fight? Any of y'all been so mad you actually did fight? Okay, less hands. It's all right. I was never a fighter. Um... I don't even know that I want to say I was a lover, not a fighter. I was a talker, not a fighter. <laughs> and so like, if there was a moment that we was about to throw down, chances are I was going to talk my way out of it, which is a great quality. All right. But I have a brother who is wired different than me. My, my brother at a certain time in his life would fight anybody. And so there were times where I was about to get into a fight and my brother would go, it's not what you do. It's what I do. And he wouldn't let me fight. Now we fought, we wrestled in the bedrooms and headlocked each other and screamed at each other. Mom would just shut the door and walk on past. <laughs> How many of you have sons and you understand? Yeah, just shut the door or she'd be yeah, boys, get outside. You get out in the yard and do that. You don't do that in my house. And so we would go do that, but we would fight, but he wouldn't let me fight. He wouldn't let me fight. I, I got called out one day and I didn't tell this story in the first service. I got called out one day and, uh, and I'm not mentioning names for the safety of those that may be involved, but I got called out one day. I want to meet you behind the park. Uh, and it was what is now Orschlands. We're going to meet behind there. We're going to throw down. My brother had been out of school for a while and he was working construction. And, and so I showed up. Rob showed up. Oh, dang it. I used the name, didn't I? <laughs> and he walks in, still got his tool belt on. Walks in. He goes, what are you doing? I said, this guy called me out. He's like, stay over there. He walks up to the guy. God is my witness, walks up, grabs his framing hammer and goes, <laughs> pops it up, grabs the hammer and goes, bam, hit the guy right in the head. <laughs> he dropped. He said, get in the truck. And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> because how many of you know you do things to your family that you won't do to other people? If you hit that guy with a hammer, I'm doing whatever he said. Okay. He wouldn't let me fight. And so like, I never had to, I never had to do that, but I always talked my way out. But what I found out as I'm getting older, as I get older, anger and offense doesn't make me want to fight. It makes me want to hate. And that one's harder to get out of. See, someone can't do that for you. It's in you. And so when somebody offends me, I immediately go, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's not what I think. Therefore, it's wrong. And so as we read about Jesus in this passage in James that his half-brother writes, and Jesus, I want you to get this number. So Jesus is asked several questions in the Gospels. In fact, throughout the entirety of the four Gospels, Jesus is asked 183 direct questions. 183 times people were like, Jesus, what do you think? And Jesus, like the boss he is, only answers three. How disappointing is that? Like, he only answers three of them directly. Now, Jesus also asks 307 questions. So about twice as many questions Jesus asked as he was asked because that's typically how he followed up. Jesus, I want healed. Would you be made whole? 
I just said that. And he just wanted them to ponder on it. Think about it. What do you think? Three times, Drake, he was able to speak slowly. To not bleh. Anybody, like, maybe you get angry, but anybody have a verbal vomit issue? There's no trigger, or there is a trigger, but there's no filter, and it's bleh. It comes out. Then you have to come back, and it's like, oh, man, I was just upset. Anybody? You all better not leave me hanging on this stuff, all right? It's going to get real long, and I can make it meaner if you want me to, okay? So I need you to walk with me. We just, I was, sorry, I was mad. Like, that's okay. We, like, that's our, that's our get out of jail. I was mad. Well, don't get mad. Oh, Pastor Vince, I'm human. This is my personality. This is my temperament. This is how God wired me. Except, remember the letter, brothers and sisters, is to people who have been made new. So your temperament and your frustrations and your irritable things, the triggers that you have that make you mad. And believe me, guys, we're great at it. Like I said, I can dial back a couple years start talking about masks and vaccines and social distancing. And I've watched the world go silly. I watched my world go silly. People were mad. Sell out. That was my favorite. I'm like, I'm not selling anything. <laughs> You're a sellout. Why? Because you made a social distance. Y'all don't sit next to each other anyway unless you have to. I could if, if there were half the number of people in here, I could remove the front eight rows and everybody would still sit in the back seat. I get, and I go, man, I can get really mad about this. Boy, I can, oof, what? I'm not selling out. And people have what they think. And I realized it didn't really matter. It didn't really matter. And it wasn't something worth walking through or arguing about. I see it all the time on social media. I got to post this. Why? Because I can. Why? Because I can. Why? Because it'll help. No, it won't. You, you, you have a heightened view of your influence if you think your post to your 400 friends in a country of, or a world of 7 billion is going to change something. That doesn't mean I can't say it. See, some of you are already starting to get a little tense. I have the right to say it. You know, something in scripture I've studied out and I've dug this because I want to make sure. There's not one time, not one time, Justin, in all of scripture where Jesus commands us to be right. Not once. Nowhere. But he does command us to be loving. And in fact, he said it's the culmination of all the Old Testament and the prophets. It is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, Vince, I love them. I just don't like them. It's not really how it works. It's not really how it works. Because A, you're a liar if you've said that. You can't. How, tell me. I just want them to have everything great in their life. I mean, except I don't. You can't do that. Love your neighbor. I also find out when we get offended by things, we really tend to, oh, let me ask you, let me ask you this question because I, I want to, I tend to go, well, when I get angry, it's about things. I get more angry at what people do, not the people. Anybody? Yeah, I love the sinner, hate the sin. That's my favorite. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Except when I talk about how much I hate the sin, I tend to call the sinner an idiot. <laughs> Are you with me? Am I alone on this? I don't think so. Because I've seen some of your social media. I end up feeling superior when it's my offense. 
when I'm angry about it, my anger elevates my thought of me being right. And since I'm right, I get to say what I want to say. (laughs) And so I have this kind of stance that says I'm right and you're wrong. Therefore, I have the ability to tell you that you're wrong. And you know what? You do. You can. But what is your greater call? To be right or to be godly? You all know the answer. And so how do we get there? Because, I mean, the reality is that the rest of this verse in James chapter 1 is really kind of intense. It says that everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because, verse 20, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Human anger does not approve. It does not produce the righteousness God desires. And man, we'll get angry about some stuff, won't we? How many of you ever been mad? I said it earlier. How many of you ever been like, I, I, this is confession. I know fast food, okay? I used to work in fast food. I used to work at a couple of them when I first started out working. And so I know that when I pull into the parking lot and I'm going through the drive through there is a certain amount of time, minutes, that I am able, should be able to pull in, get my food, and be gone. There is a specific time. It's the reason their production is so fantastic. It's the reason McDonald's can say billions and billions served is because there is a system to get you in and out of the parking lot. They have a system to get you in the lobby and back out of the lobby. And so when that system gets messed up, I stand there like this. <laughs> Now look at the stranger. How many of you are people that get offended? Say amen. How many of you are people that get offended and then actually say something about your offense? Okay. I couldn't tell if that was more or less. Okay. But I'll stand there and I'm like, this would be a fantastic place for a fast food restaurant, wouldn't it? Yeah, I'm I'm bad. Had one lady, I was going through McDonald's and they had adjusted their drink machine. And so when I ordered a Coke, it left about two inches empty at the top of my cup. And I just held it out the window. (laughs) She handed it to me, put it in my hand. And I'm like, (laughs) Jennifer's over here hitting me on the arm. Like, stop it. (laughs) Disappointment all over my face. I didn't think I was that person. As I get older, it's getting worse. Anybody testify to that? Uh, They didn't warn us about that, did they? I love the commercial that says you may be turning into your parents. (laughs) And I'm like, dang. Uh, I mean, my parents are great, but um, I get offended like that. And so I see these offenses that are there. And so like, I can be offended, but I, I, some things get me, some things don't. A few years ago, there was a guy that was pulling out of a parking lot and, and, I, and, and, and he decided that he needed to compliment me. So as he pulled out of the parking lot, he flipped me off all the way around the corner. Like, and then when he got outside, there was a real life church sticker in his back window. This is one of my favorite moments as a pastor. And, and literally I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there going, there's no way that just happened. And what I probably would have done now, I'd have been like, Oh, I am lighting that dude on fire at church on Sunday. He didn't know it was me. I'm going to call out his license plate number and his truck and everything. I'm now I'm, I wanted to follow him. And then I sat there for a second and I was like, you know, I'm not a great driver. (laughs) He probably had reason. Because I pulled up to the stop sign and then I was like, I'm going to go. No, I'm not going to go. And so I pulled out about three feet and then stopped. And this guy's like, boom, boom. And then. (laughs) Yeah. And man, I, I. No, I didn't get mad at all. I actually, I actually probably, the guy behind me was probably flipping me off because I sat at that stop sign laughing so hard. I'm like, that just happened. <laughs> you imagine though, like one of your kids not noticing it's you and it's like, hey. <laughs> it's kind of what it felt like. Here I am loving my flock and there he is giving me the bird. So, 
we get offended about stuff. Things make us angry. And in that, we, we end up running into problems again because what we get angry about, the things we tend to get angry about, we call it self-righteous. We call it self, this is righteous anger, Pastor Ben. This is righteous anger. What, Jesus flipped tables. Jesus got mad in the New Testament, flipped over tables. And, and let me just clarify, just one very, very obvious point. You ain't him. And I guarantee you, let me just ask the question this way. Do you believe you can get angry and stay perfect? You can't. Don't try. I'm telling you, you can. Jesus, that was it. Because the problem is we, we have what, I don't think it's righteous anger. I think it's self-righteous anger. I think I get mad at the things other people do. And that's what I call my righteous anger. If somebody believes different than I do, I'm mad at them. Why? Because it's righteous anger. God wants me to believe this way and they believe another way. And so I'm righteously angry at them. But what no one ever has righteous anger about is their own sin. No one ever comes in and goes, Vince, I'm so frustrated that I can't quit this sin in my life. I wish I could. And I don't know what to do with it. And it's frustrating me. And, I'm, and I just want this to be gone. No. I get, how do I deal with people that, that don't think about abortion like I do? Or don't think about these rights or those rights like I do? What am I supposed to do with them? Because I know I'm right. And I go, you're supposed to love them. That's the only command we got, love them. You say, I don't know how to do that. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you two ways. Two things that will help. I, listen, man, if I, had, if I had the switch for this, I'd have turned it on a long time ago. So I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you some things. And you can write them down, but I can't make you do them. So how do I, how do I keep from being offended? And before we answer that question, let me ask you another question. How effective do you think your offense is like how, how like when you get mad is it really changing people pointing them towards Christ is your offense so valid that people are like man they're right I should love Jesus more or is it just a soapbox moment for you to get mouthy online Be careful Be careful because here's the thing <laughs> You'll answer for that one. You will stand before an almighty God and go, yeah, there's a season my political ideology weighed more than the cross of Calvary. There's a season where my thoughts of the public school system or our city's voting background or whatever was way more important than anyone actually coming to know you. You will confess that before an almighty God. So how do I not be offended? How do I not be offended? First, lower your expectation of others. You're like, what? I know, it's so non-American because from the time our kids are born, we begin to tell them they can be anything, right? You could be the president. You could be this. You could be that. I swear, when I was nine years old, I'm pretty sure I was going to be a firefighter on the moon playing pro baseball. <laughs> I mean, right? Because, I mean, I could do anything. Why? Because everybody said, you can do anything you set your mind to. And let's just be honest, that's a lie. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe you should have expectations. I just think we, we don't do it right. Because there's some reality that has to set in. Uh, when, when I was younger, I played a lot of baseball. And so playing a lot of baseball, my family, when I'd go home to see my family up in Ohio, my, my mom, God bless my mama, she would tell everybody, Vince going to play pro ball. Vince going to play pro ball. Vince going to play pro ball. A few years ago, I got to go to spring training. Okay? I don't know if you've ever been to a professional athletic event, but there is something vastly different. Okay? One of my, my favorite team is the Yankees, okay? You can hate me if you want. It's a good sermon about a fence. Get over it. Um, <laughs> but I went to spring training, and I was reading through the lineup card. It was like playing second base is this guy, 
six foot four, 240 pounds. I'm like, what in the world? That's the second baseman. Like when I played baseball, the second baseman was this guy. This guy. We put the little guy there. And then I started reading. First baseman, six foot six. Right fielder, six foot six. And I'm like, these are not people. <laughs> My favorite player right now playing currently is Aaron Judge. Love Aaron Judge. Love him. Great. Fantastic baseball player. But he is what's known as a freak of nature. When I say he is six foot eight, 278 pounds running around an outfield, chasing down fly balls. That means he's fast also. Fast and that much human being. Someone should have told me. <laughs> like I sat there at spring training and watched him run by the dugout and thought, my mom's a liar. <laughs> my whole life, she told me. And, <laughs> now listen, I don't know what six foot eight is. I know what 280 pounds is, but, but it's very different on six foot eight than it is five foot 10. All right. It's very different. And so I'm watching and, and, and we believe this. So we, we have these expectations of people that we put on them and we go, I can't believe they would do that. I can't believe the way they treat their kids. I can't believe the way that spouse treated the other spouse. I can't believe they would cheat. I can't believe they would lie. I can't, this world is going to hell. No kidding. It's been going to hell, and we think people are supposed to act different. Let me tell you, Paul wrote this out. He wrote it. He was writing to Timothy. He's writing to a young pastor at a church, and he says, Timothy, I need to, I need to give you some, some insight on your expectations. And it says this. It says, uh, let me give you the text. So if you want to write it down, you can. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 through 4. People will be. Does this sound like there's any doubt in Paul's language there? No. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's us. That's me and that's you. And we sit around and go, oh, I can't believe it's in there. You should have believed it because it's in there. Paul said, that's who we are. They lied. It's in there. They cheated in there. I, the reason we don't believe it is because in our Christianity, it's easier for us to take a pharisaical view of what's outside me rather than what's inside me, which is what Christianity does. See, in the, in, the, in the Jewish law, when the Pharisees were running things, it was, what do people see of me? And Jesus flipped it and said, what is that that's within you? See, I go, but the one I come, it'll even be better because I am with you, but he will be in you, the Holy Spirit. And so we have these expectations. You watch Jesus. I, see, I get this all the time. I was hurt by the church, Pastor Vince. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. You can be mad if you want. You won't be the first. But you were not hurt by the church. You were not hurt by God. You were not hurt by Jesus. You were hurt by a flawed individual who was one of those things on that list and didn't do it right. And because they didn't do it right, the enemy won because you got ticked at the church for several years. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to let you down. I will. Um, if you have my cell phone number and you don't text me a question, I won't answer you. If you say, hey, <laughs> I'm not responding, hey, <laughs> I won't. I, I have a grandmother. She said, I texted you happy birthday and you didn't say anything. And I said, it wasn't a question. <laughs> I don't respond if it's not a question. I got too much to do. Plus, I'd rather you call me. I'm a talker, not a texter. It's just me. It's preference. And I've made some people mad. I, I will disappoint. There are times as your pastor that I will disappoint you. And if I do, let me back that up. When I do, when I do, please don't blame God or this building or the name on the wall. Blame the flawed, broken human being that is still working through who God wants him to be. 
Make sure you don't pass your offense onto something that's not real. And so if you lower your expectations, Jesus was amazing at this. Jesus rolled right up to Zacchaeus, the wee little man. You guys know the one I'm talking about? Zacchaeus was a crook. Crook. Extortionist. Skimming off the top. Roman job, Jewish background. He was a traitor and a crook. Jesus said, I'm going to the house for dinner. No. Do you know what he does? Yep. You know who's going to be there? Yep. And you're just going to go right in? Yep. Well, that offends us. Well, it might save them. So that's what we're going to do. In fact, there's another story where Jesus rolls up to this well outside Samaria. That lady was scandalous. Five husbands shacking up now. That's who she was. That was scandalous then. Is now. Five husbands, good grief. What are you doing wrong? That can't be godly. And yet here was God right in the middle of it. Right in the middle of it. Rolling up, leaning on the well. What are you up to? It's getting water. You know, would you like something that'll change your life? I can show you, I can tell you. And I can give you what you truly need rather than judge you for what you've truly been. And he changed your eternity. Now, he didn't do the typical Christian thing where he runs onto this person who's got this train wreck of a life going on and he didn't go back to Peter, James, and John and go, we should tell, we, we, we should, we should, we, have I got something for you? I got to tell you about this and we're going to pray about it so we can make it spiritual, but in reality, I just need to gossip. Be careful of what you call a prayer request and make sure that's legitimately what it is and not just your way to vent the gossip that you got because it's still sinful, whatever you title it. He didn't go back to Peter, James, and John. Peter tried this. He was arrogant too. Peter said, I'm the one, God. I won't leave you or forsake you. I will stand. Even if all the others run and hide, I'm your guy. Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. You don't know, Peter. He's coming at you right now because of your arrogance, and your arrogance is going to set you up for a fall. And they're standing in the courtyard the third time that Peter denies Christ. It says that Jesus caught his eye. See? Your arrogance and your offense. You flipped on me so fast. The Bible says that Peter left and wept bitterly. Lower your expectations of people, they're going to fail. Don't expect, them, don't expect them to live a godly standard that you yourself are laboring to live if you're there at all. And if you are getting frustrated, make, pray that God would give you the filter of your own sin first. Because we all know, we've told the people this, we've told our kids this from the time we've known this story. You cannot remove the splinter out of someone's eye without the beam coming out of yours. Don't do that. Don't be that person. There's too many that have been that person for the church and too many people sitting outside right now going, we're never going to the church because we know how those people act. You know how to fix that? Act different. Lower your expectations of people. Second thing, here we go. You've got to raise your gratitude for the grace of God. Raise your gratitude for the grace of God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Y'all know the song? Yeah. We love to sing the song, but I doubt any of you have really maybe described yourself like Newton did when he wrote that song. It saved a wretch. A wretch of no value. He saved a wretch like me. I once was lost no direction, no place to go. But now I'm found. I was blind. I had no vision. Couldn't even see where to go if I wanted to. But because of grace, I now see. 
And so when we raise our, our, our image of God's grace, when we raise the gratitude and the recognition that I am what I am by the grace of God. I got, no, I got no space to get mad at you. I got no reason to be offended by something you said or something you did. I promise you it's going to make your relationships a whole lot easier. It's going to make your conversations a whole lot easier because your focus shifts from being right to being Christ. I just want to be Jesus in any situation. Guess what? I'm going to have to talk to some people that are different than I am. It's going to happen. They're going to even believe different than I do. And I can get mad at what they believe. Or I can love them towards something greater. I can pray for them. I can hope for them. Pastor Vince, you don't understand. I know. I know. Because I, I, it's flippant, right? Because we're talking about politics and we're talking about getting cut off and flipped off. But some of you have deep offense. Somebody, somebody's abused you. There was a spouse that cheated on you. And your offense is deep. And it feels valid. It feels right. It feels right. Because what they did, and I'm sorry, I'm so sorry for what they did. But you still have to look through the filter of, for me, it's my spiritual pride about the time I want to throw somebody under the bus because of what they did. I have to go, you are so arrogant. You are so arrogant that you get to feel like you get to cast judgment because you're right. Are you further down the road than they are? You're more mature in your faith than they are. And so your goal, you're going to just light them on fire because you can? This happened. And so there's this, there's this group of angry guys that roll up. And they got Jesus. They roll up on this lady and she was wrong. Wrong. She caught in the act of adultery, wrong. And they're like, we're right. We got her. This is what she's done, Jesus. You know what the law says. You spoke about it. You know what it says. We can stone her in the street. We can kill her where she's standing. And we are right in doing so. And they had their stones. They had their rocks waiting. Just give us the word. Give us the word. And Jesus again, when they said she was caught in adultery, Jesus didn't go, ah, ah, what? Who does such things? Nope. He's rolled up. I can see him looking The Bible says he begins to write. The Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote. Theologians believe that not because of what he wrote, but because of how the people left, it gives us insight. If you study this in John chapter 8, the Pharisees that were there holding the stone, the Bible says that they all left oldest the youngest. And they walked away. So theologians believe that in order to make them leave like that, it must have been some sort of list. Yeah, you're right. You can throw the stone. Who's, who's you? You're first. Go ahead. No, you? You're, okay. Go ahead. And they all walked away. One by one, they all left. Now you and I, we don't live in that culture anymore. Some of you will never throw the stone, but because you believe you were right, you hold on to that sucker. 
and you threaten, boy. But I'm right. I can be mad about it. I can be offended about it because I, it was me that was wronged. It was me that was offended. And I may not throw it, but I always want to have it so I can argue with. I want to have it so I can argue with it. I want to have it so I got something to fall back on. I wonder today if you could What would it take for God to release you of that so that you can drop the stone and walk away? What would it take? I want you to bow with me. Listen, I don't, I don't know the offense. I don't know the offense. No one moving around. No one taking off right now. Some of you, I know you're supposed to go serve, but I want you to sit tight for a second. For some of you, this is life changing. This is a door that God is offering you to give it up, to lay it, put the stone down and go, I'm giving up my right to be right. And I'm going to be godly. I don't know what the offense was. I don't know what's making you angry, but I know there is, a, there is a cross where redemption falls. There is grace. See, here's the reality. If I elevate my, my gratitude to the grace of God and I look back and see the phrase there in Ephesians where he says, for I have been saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God. I didn't do anything to deserve it. How do I get to carry a stone around? How do, I didn't do anything to merit my salvation. How do I get to carry a rock? I don't. So today, is it time? Is it time today? Come on. You know right now, if there is an offense, if there is an anger, if there is a forgiveness and you, I don't, you know right now what it is. God brought it to your mind that fast. Come on. It's your door. He's giving you the door. Walk through it. Come and lay it down. Come and drop the stone. Say, God, I'm, I'm not carrying it with me anymore. Come on. Take a step out of your seat right now. I told you submission was not going to be easy. This is where you submit. Lord, I am giving it to you. I am giving my offense to you. I am giving my ability to be mad at you. I am giving this to you, God. I'm laying it down. Come on, some are coming. You need to move. You need to move. Don't sit there and know differently. Don't sit there and know differently. Don't sit there holding the rock while God is writing your sin on the stand. Move. change something today in submission to Christ and see what he does. Come on. Come on, people of all ages, doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter what you've walked through. There is a God who has something incredible for you. Will you surrender it and submit it to him today? Will you allow his grace and his forgiveness and his mercy and his goodness, will you allow it to do something incredible in your life? Will you be different for the world tomorrow because of what Jesus has taken away from you? Come on. Hey, you're not going to be alone up here. Pastor Vince, if I walk up there, they'll know. No, they won't. I promise you, they're not even thinking about you. They're not even thinking about you. That's just a lie from the enemy telling you that. Come on. Submit today. Submit thy ways unto the Lord. He will direct your path. Still people coming. I'm in no hurry, but you... It's up to you. I, I don't, man, I want to, 
I don't get to come get you. God has not freed me up to do that, nor would I ever think to. But some of you wrestling with some stuff right now, you got some baggage, some weight that is dragging your faith down. Some of you need to forgive others and some of you need to forgive yourself. And drop the stone. Trust that Jesus has a better plan for you. Father, I pray for these that have came forward. God, and I pray for those not only here, but even in their seats now. It's so hard, so hard to be honest with you. God, help us to lay our offense down. Realize the greatest fight we have, the greatest call we have is to elevate you not our ideas, not our preferences, not our thoughts, but to elevate the cross, to make you spoken of. God, I ask that you would walk with us, that you'd lead us, that you'd guide us, that you'd direct us in all our ways. But God, that we would submit to you, that we would learn this discipline, God, that we would submit our ways unto you so that you can direct our paths. God, I pray for all of these that are here, whether in the seats praying or at the altar praying. And God, we'll give you all the grace, all the glory, all the honor. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.